Alright, um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning. Okay, kita mulakan dengan baca umum kita Al-Fatihah. Alright, so um, today we will continue the uh, chapter 6 yeah, which is about uh, the test of the stars and of course this is the last topic and uh, somehow uh, just to resume again what we have learned so far right um this is about um how we want to um determine yeah the uh, level and also the, the process of the death of the star for the massive stars and also the uh, low massive stars so it actually have a difference um evolutions and also evolution stage of um the death yeah the death stage and uh, we do have a process such as a supernova neutron stars the black hole right for the case of the massive stars and um uh, for the case of the low massive stars, right? So we do have a process such as the planetary nebula and also the white dwarf. Okay, somehow we have covered so far about the supernova, yeah, what is the neutron stars and also the black hole. Okay, so um this is a part of the schematic diagrams to show the difference between the ma uh, low mass and also the high mass of the stars. And basically it start with the um after the the main sequence stars because we know that this is a part of the post main sequence such as the red giant yeah the super giant stars and that is the difference and then it will start and continue with the planetary nebula and also the white dwarf for the case of the low mass stars while for the case of high mass star it will go to the um supernova explosion after the super giant stage and um after that, it will form a quite small object, what we call as a neutron star and also the uh, black hole. Okay, so that's the difference between the low and also the high massive stars. And um, let's look um the um, stage where we have learned so far about the supernova. Alright, we do know that um, we do have the supernova type 1 and so supernova type 2. Okay, and uh, in the case of this, uh, you need to identify yeah, um, uh, what is the um, compositions and also the um, the the evolutions of, of the supernova. So this is the part that is very important, all right, for the case of high and also the case of low massive stars. And then uh, we recovered about the neutron stars, right, and uh, of course. Uh, this is the stage where, um, for the case of the high massive stars, and um, it do have the undergoing core collapse, what we call as a type two supernova, right? And it do have the process of the neutron degenerates matters. So this is the part that we have learned, yeah. Um, and uh, we stop until, uh, this one, okay. Right. So um, to show yeah the difference between um the neutron stars with the white dwarf and also our earth so this is very very small it is a, just a little bit uh, a dot only right so if you see here but somehow it do have the special characteristic for the case of the neutron stars okay and even if we, we uh, compare with the white dwarf white dwarf is still uh, large yeah so we can see it, uh, even we call it as dwarf but it's still a large size of objects Yes, compared to our Earth itself, okay, and uh, this is the uh, pulsar, all right? So we can see, um, uh, credited with um, Kramer, yeah? we can see that it do have a light beam house. Yeah? It's uh, it looks like a light beam house, but somehow the time for the rotation is very very fast. Yeah, and this is the fastest one that have been detected uh, so far, okay. So, um, so this is the part of the characteristic. It is so small, right, and a very dim. But somehow, um, we can see only a few isolated um neutron stars yeah, that can be observed directly. It might be a lot, but somehow, uh, this is a uh, has been detected by optical observations. So, and also by um radio observations. Yeah. So, this is part of the uh pulsar. And uh, pulsar is actually a part of the neutron stars, but not neutron star can be a pulsar. Okay. And um, what is pulsar actually? 
it stands for pulsating radio source, right? And it's produced two powerful beams of radiation with the magnetic fields about uh, 10 power of 8 Tesla. So this is very, very strong magnetic field. Okay, so basically we just have a few thousand here, but somehow it's about 10 power of 8 Tesla at outside there. And um, the axis of rotation is not aligned with the magnetic poles somehow. And uh, somehow we also have also so far a few pulsar using the optical telescope, yeah, using the space telescope, which has been detected in terms of uh, gamma and also X3 wave band. Okay, currently we do have 1,700 um, pulsars, yeah, uh, and mostly has been detected by 64 meter um, Parker stage. So this is actually has been detected so far in radio observations. Okay. And um, it do have very precise rotation yeah? because we can see uh, the light curve um, have uh, detected a very fast um, speed in terms of rotations and it means that it more precise than the best hydrogen master clocks on the earth because we can just only um, detect it in the second units. But this is about more than um, shortest one here. Yeah? And uh, one of the main characteristics which is very special is the pulsar also have the very extreme gravitational fields and high weights of the spin. Yeah, so we just imagine it can speed very fast. It's not just about milliseconds or so on, but it's a negative something. Yeah. And this is a provide a very useful test of the general relativity. It's about the Big Bang theories related with the cosmology. And uh, our first known uh, double pulsar systems is um, discovered in the 2003. And um, this is very interesting to um, observe and also to be discussed in terms of theory. All right. So um, basically, we can put um, or sketch the schematic diagram of the pulsar like this. Okay, it will have the spin axis, it will have the magnetic axis, and uh, this magnetic axis can be focused to the Earth. And we can see the spin, right? And um, we can have also this kind of um, uh, image which uh, represent of the light curve of the crab pulsar, for instance. So we can see a little dot that means that this is actually represent the rotation of the, the pulsar. And um, um, the second diagram shows the light curve of the crab pulsar. And we can see it to have the periodic um, light curve. Yeah, and uh, this is very interesting because um, this is very very short yeah in terms of the uh, period idea. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is all about pulsar. Now we move on to the black hole. Yeah, um, the um, very interesting um, object and uh, things that um people like to know what is black hole is yeah. And uh, this black hole is one of the example, yeah, competing of GRO J165540. So this is represented as the black hole code. And uh, as a part of the schematic diagram, it do have it do believe it do have the relativity stage, um, accretion disk, yeah, the companion stars, and uh, this companion star is actually an indicator to observe the black hole. So we believe that which part of the universe that we can detect the black hole, right? It's not easy because it's not been observed in the electromagnetic spectrum unless uh, using the um, radio observation with the special techniques. Okay. And um, it can be called as an object. It can also be called as a region. So we don't know what is, is it an object or is it an a region? Um, whereas uh, the pool of gravity is so strong and nothing can escape from it. So um, the speed of velocity can exceed speed of light, of course. And um, it has been coined in 1968 by physicists of John Miller. And um, the possibility of the lump of the matter could also compress to the point. So this is shows how does the gravitational effect is, yeah? um, how speed it is, how very fast it is um, in terms of the speed of light. And um, it also um, compressed to one point at which its uh, surface gravity would present the escape of light and be suggested in 18th century. So early, uh, uh, sorry, in, at the late of the 18th century, it has been 
um, suggested yeah, by John Michel and then by Pierre, Simon and also Marcus de Laplace. So I'm sure that you know what is, uh, who is Laplace is, yeah, a part of the person or astrophysicist, uh, sorry, the physicist in terms of the mechanic quantums. Okay, and um, then we can have that, uh, you do also have in terms of mass, all right, um, you can see what happens to the stellar remnants for about three solar masses or less. So because we know that black holes is actually a formation after the supernova and the remnant less than 1.4 solar masses become a white dwarf. Okay, The core of the um, range of 1.4 to 3 solar masses will become a neutron stars. Right, so remember again what is neutron star is yeah? the diameter is about 10 km spheres and rapidly spinning the neutron degenerate matters. Okay, and um, young stars okay, uh, of neutrons may also detect as pulsar. All right, and uh, in the case of this one, all right, um, this is the process where how does the black hole form? Yeah, um. After all, the mass loss process exceed the limits that even neutron degenerates can also pressure can with them. So uh, the material keeps collapsing inwards until all the mass becomes the concentrated at single point. And this is what we call as a black hole. So um, one good point of the uh, black hole is about singularity. Yeah? So means that all masses, we just imagine all the masses yeah, at that space, can be concentrated in one point. So it's not easy. Even our Earth, for instance, our planets and itself, just imagine, can be concentrated at one point only. So it means that that is a part of black hole. Okay. So um, this object is actually one component of binary system. And metro petrus of its orbits, yeah? so it's a nearby giant companion. And of course, um, some of the characteristics is charged object that generally accelerated due to the central battle force, which emit the high frequency synchrotron radiation. So you need to know what is the uh, what is the synchrotron radiation, yeah. And of course, it also basically at the stage of the high frequency, which means that it can be observed in the short wavelength, uh, such as the ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma rays wavebands. Okay. So, um, of course, some of theories um related with the Big Bang, and uh, this um, um, we can imagine yeah, what kind of the black hole is. If we can put the mass at one point of atom, right, with about uh, ten power of eleven kilograms. So just imagine, even we are a, a few kilograms, all right. Maybe a person um is about um maybe say 60 to 70 kilograms, so we can see it's not our in atom version. So yeah? we do have a, uh, a part of the uh, of the uh, size, which means that about 170 centimeters, for instance. But somehow, this is one atom, one little dot, right? So the little dot can comprise up to 10 power of 11 kilograms. So this is what we mean of the black hole is. Okay. And um, black holes, um, of course, begin to take a modern um, form, all right, uh, by um, Carl Schwarzschild, by Einstein, yeah, with the general uh, general theory of relativity, and um, of course, is squeezed down to the dimensionless point of the singularity, and um, of course, we do have um, the boundary is what we call as a event horizon. So we know that the project of the event horizon that has been uh, popular um, within few hours, uh, sorry, few years here. And uh, since no event can occur inside it, even be also from the outside. So um, that is about the um, project of the event horizon. Okay. And um, some of the astrophysicists, such as Haslan Cinder, has described a mechanism by uh, which the black hole might um, actually be created in the real universe. A star of a exhausted all its useful nuclear fuels, they found that no longer support itself against the inward pull of its own gravity. So this is based on their theory. Okay. And um, 
Of course, um, any mass is su sufficiently compressed would become a black hole, right? So this is one of the main criteria. And if the sun would be suffered, uh, suffer this fit, so it means that it was shrunk down to a ball by 2.5 diameter, kilometer in diameter. So it means that we know that the size of the radius um, suns now, just imagine it became compressed uh, as small as 2.5 kilometers. It's just a, a um, distance about one uh, new state. Yeah, UITM, for instance, the, the radius in terms of radius. So it's very, very small for the sun. Yeah? And um, of course, a stellar black holes is only like the results from the heavyweight stars. And remnant core exceeds about the Oppenheimer Volkov limit, which is exceeding the supernova explosions. Okay, so somehow we do have um, detected about two dozen, yeah, about 24 um, stellar black holes. Uh, as, a, as, we, as a candidate and uh, in the Milky Way yeah? and now uh, we can also have that um, the microcosm Sagittarius contain the closest black hole in the, uh, to the Earth with the distance about 1,500 light years. So this is where the current observation Sagittarius A that has been detected and been proved um, by observation this year the Sagittarius A, and the, the distance is about 1,500 light years. So this is the nearest that holds so far, all right? Um, we believe that it might be more, but somehow it's, that might be limited to also because of the distance, okay? And um, some of the schematic diagram or illustration by artist impression what is black hole is, um, in a certain part of the galaxy, so it, been, it might be illustrated like this or might be like this. Yeah? So, based on the companion stars yeah, be, um, besides the black hole. Okay, now, so let's move to the uh, evolution of the death of the low mass stars. We know that it do have the two main objects here. First one is the planetary nebula. And the second one is at, uh, the white dwarf. Okay, so this is based on theoretical high shoot traps protostars. And we do have the um, schematic diagram of HR um, diagram, which represent the absolute magnitude, the luminosity of the white axis with the as, uh, effective temperature and also the spectral class that can be represented in the um, S axis. Okay. So we know that um, in uh, general, what is white dwarf is, um, maybe it's new for you, what is the planetary nebula, okay? Um, basically, this is the, um, how does the single star spawn, okay? It start with the clouds collapse, yeah? um, please remember what is uh, ISM is, interstellar medium, and um, it move out through the process of rotating this. Yeah, be, after that, whereas there is a process of outflow and also infall process before a mature uh, solar system happen. Yeah, and uh, then only it will form the planet formations. So this is a process of the um, general idea to see how does the single star bonds in the planet formations, and. Um, if we look through the low massive stars, right, um, from the red stage, um, of the red giant stage, so we, it can be less than eight times of the solar mass. So it means that if the star is less than um, eight times of the solar mass, then it comes as the low massive stars, and it still convert um from the hydrogen to helium here, yeah, and then into the carbon and oxygens inside its core until the helium runs out and uh, this is the, for the second time of its life the nuclear reactions will stop and the gravity uh, once again take the upper hand okay then um the star does not have enough mass to restart what happened is this is the point where the second stage the star does not have enough mass to restart in any nuclear reactions then the core will contract until the electrons are so tightly bound. Okay, 
So uh, this makes the cost becomes a white dwarf. And now the size is about our earth size. Okay. Right. So what's the uh, core contrast? The outer layer of the stars will be uh, lift, uh, lift up of forming a ring of gas. So this is the unique things about the platinum nebula. It will form a ring of gas, right, around the collapsing hole. And then uh, uh, at the same time, okay, the white dwarf will shine for a few thousand years, giving off the heat generated when the core contracted. So this is a uh, uh, main point for the white dwarf, okay, right. So if you look to the the image here, so we do have the examples of the ring nebula M57 in Lyra constellations, and this has been detected by Hubble Space Telescope. We do have um, it look like a ring, right? So we can see the formation of the planetary nebula, and this is one of the example of the cat's eye nebula, which is a dying creates the fantasy or light sculpture of the cat and also the dust. Right, so this is also by the half space telescope. So it looks like the kite eyes, yeah. Um, and uh, one of the criteria of the planetary nebula is it to have the luminous shell of gas, okay, often of complex structure, and um, of course the fluorescent by evolved stars less than uh, four solar masses, okay, and um. One person that has been coined is by he, uh, William Hirschel in 1780s. Alright, so um, based on the appearance suggests that the greenish of the is of the Uranus. Okay, so first planetary nebula has been detected in uh, was um, is a dumbbell nebula, right? So it been catalogued in Messiah catalog in 1764. And then we do can detect and observe the ring nebula, the little dumbbell nebula, and the O nebula, right? So even in uh, 70s um, decades have been detected, yeah, this kind of the planetary, planetary nebula. And then uh, we can observe about uh, 2,000 planetary nebula so far in our Milky Way with um, the total um, galactic population put is about 10,000. Okay, um, this is actually um, not more than about 50,000 years and uh, it's a stage of the uh, sun may pass about 5 billion years from now. Okay, so of course it might be more for the case of the object of the planetary nebula. Okay, but somehow um, it has been detected more than uh, 2,000. Okay. And uh, this formation of planetary nebula begins when the star has evolved to become the Myra stars. And uh, it's actually a pulsating red giant that shapes matters in the form of the strong stellar wind. Okay? And at this stage, of course, the star has inactive carbon core that is surrounded by the helium uh, burning shell. Okay? And because of the instability, um, which is um, increased right, uh, at the outer layers, so it will break free at a certain point and uh, with the speed of the about 20 km per second and uh, it will leave him behind a hot a death stellar core so that's why we can see the ring and at the same time we can see the core inside it okay all right so um high energy ultraviolet radiation pouring um from the exposed core uh, and the surface is about 10,000 um, kelvin which will uh, absorb uh, by the uh, nebula material and be emitted. Yeah. And uh, of course, there is certain unusual spectral lines, which known as a forbidden lines. And this is at the point of um, 5007 M strong, which means that it do have the double ionized oxygen there. Okay, so that's why you can see it's glowing, yeah? one of the reasons. And basically, it's in the yellow color or maybe a green color because we based off the wavelength. Okay, so um, it will become visible in a glowing disk, a ring, and more elaborate uh, shape. Okay. So, um, of course, uh, there is evidence of the bipolar flow. And um, you can see at the butterfly nebula and also at the ant nebula. All right. Um, in terms of diameter, 
right? The diameter is about one light years. So it means that it's not a small, yeah, it's not a small object because it's about one light years, right? But somehow, um, it also do have a range, yeah, which is due to the aspect of the age. For instance, um, we do have NGC three nine one eight in Centaurus, which have um only three thousand years old, but somehow it's about zero point three light years across. And we do have um Helix Nebula in Arcturus, which is believed to um, be ten thousand years old, and the diameter is about two point five light years. So it based on the age. Yeah. So more um of course. Uh, if the age is more, or the distance also will be longer, right? And um, we can see also the density is about 10 power of 3 particles per centimeter cube and up to 10 power of 6 particles per centimeter cube with the temperature about 10,000 Kelvin, okay? But of course, it will have the range, yeah? uh, it might be 8 to 20,000 Kelvin. Okay, in terms of um, expansion speed, is uh, this object is about 20 to 30 km per second. And of course, this planetary nebula becomes too spread out to be visible um, after 10,000 to 15,000 years. So before that, we cannot see. So it means that it takes a long time to see the planetary nebula. Okay. Right. So, uh, hopefully you understand what is the characteristic of the planetary nebula, right? So, now we move on to the white dwarf. And of course, uh, white dwarf is quite easy compared to uh, planetary nebula because you are familiar with this. And um, you do have in HR diagram, okay? And uh, in this case, this is a post-main sequence, which means that the process of the converting hydrogen to helium by nuclear fusion in their course, the sun, for example, is classified as the yellow dwarf. Okay, so um, one of the examples is white dwarf in globular cluster M four, and uh, it, it specifically can see that uh, this is about twelve billion years old, which means that the oldest yet observed with the magnitude of thirteen magnitude. So it's very very dim, right? Okay, it has the unusual properties. Yeah. Why? Because if they are very small, yeah, they are more massive uh, compared to the smaller one. So it means that if the um uh, the white dwarf is very small, then it's much more very more massive. Supposed to be contradict, yeah, because if we have more massive, it means that the size will be more, but somehow the size will be small. That's why the properties is being unusual. Okay. And um, it also composed by your carbon, okay, and also oxygen ion mix, okay, with the C of degenerate electrons, and uh, the degeneracy pressure will be provided by the electrons that uh, prevents further collapse, okay. So the core temperature can be as high as ten power of seven Kelvin. So this is very very high temperature, okay. And of course, the heat cannot be escaped quickly. It will take time, a long time. Okay, and um, if you look through here, um, not only more massive dwarf smaller than the less massive one, but they also less in terms of luminous, of the reason unexplained above. So, in terms of mass and also in terms of luminous, it is actually contradicts and um, be classified as a uh, unusual properties so um, this might be unique why you want to observe the white dwarf why but means uh, why the reason be behind it yeah why does the small uh, size means that it has the massive one okay so um, somehow we can see the examples um, as such as serious b and also prof Cyan b this is a uh, example of the white dwarf okay all right, so this is about the white dwarf. So far, um, if you look through um, the HR diagram again, we can see the post main sequence track here, whereas um, after the main sequence, it moved to the giants, 
and then uh, somehow some of the stars will move to the supergiant cell and uh, of course there's a stage of the planetary nebula there before it moves to the um, supernova explosions whereas the core remnant and have the cool rapidly contracts to the white dwarf all right so the white dwarf is actually the end of the stage for the low massive stars okay and we can see an example such as the Poseidon B and also the Sirius B there all right so that is the end of the this chapter and at the end of the discourse right so i hope that um you will uh, do the revision right so we will discuss our uh, topics the whole topics yeah, from the first chapters to the six chapters after this um, in the next sessions yeah and with that uh, thank you very much so we end with the speaking for and swore to us Okay, alright, so thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh.